So in, in here, if you hover over the here, they'll all come up. And then you just click on that one to bring it up when you want to introduce the board. Oh, okay. But don't close that. Just minimize it because um, the nominations piece is... Here. Oh, Megan, is this the 41st? <laughs> uh, no, I think it's, it would be the same as our so it would be our 40th. Does it say on here? 41st. Okay, let's go with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's nice to have to settle people with that are having nice, uh, quiet chatter as we enter into the 41st annual general meeting for the Island Nature Trust. Um, COVID had its way with us, as we know, so we are going with a format tonight that's brand new for us. Uh, we have, of course, people in the room, but we also have quite a few people joining us online through a uh, YouTube channel, and uh, welcome to all of those as well. So we know we have a quorum and membership, which is a lovely way to have because people had to register. And so, uh, as we know, only the members um, have the privilege to, to vote at, uh, on issues that require that. Um, the only COVID piece is that if we are moving around and everybody's being very respectful wearing masks, if anybody needs a mask, Janelle has extras at the back of the room. And before we even start, I just want to mention that Dave Carmichael, who would be a household name to many of us here, um, a provincial horticulturalist, his new book is being launched next week, Native uh, Trees, Shrubs, and Vines of PEI, a pictorial, a pictorial library. And all the proceeds from the sale of Dave's Brown, Dave's groundbreaking book will be going to uh, different charitable organizations. So we're really looking forward to that, and I hope we can all support him uh, in having a copy for our, for our homes. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And it's such a great pleasure to be chairing this meeting. I'm June Jenkins Sanderson. I'm the president of this great organization. It's been a great year, lots of accomplishments, and of course, we've had lots of challenges. I've come to think of Island Nature Trust as a kind of a vehicle that allows all of us, residents and non-residents, people who love this fair island, to contribute to being able to protect and store the land and educate islanders around what we have um, in our province. Um, the visionaries who founded this great organization 41 years ago uh, had a clear picture of the need for such an organization. They actually model it off of the National Trust in, Eng in England. And we have a few people with us tonight that have been around since that time and have been inf influenced the founding of the organization and have been influential ever since. So I want to welcome in particular PEI Senator, the Honorable Diane Griffin, who was indeed... <laughs> 
who was our first executive director for this organization, so it's near and dear to her heart. And then I know we have Dan McCaskill and Rosemary Curley in our midst as well. And I hate to single out people because I'm always afraid we'll miss someone, uh, but they've been since the start and are still strong supporters and influencers of the work of the trust. Is there anybody else here that I'm missing that I'm not conscious of? Diane was telling me today that Doc McCory was the first president of this organization, Ian, Dr. Ian McCory. Uh, of course, a professor at UPEI and a uh, strong uh, community influencer in uh, all things environmental. Uh, first order of business tonight is the approval of the minutes from the 2019 AGM. I think everybody, I hope, has had an opportunity to look at them, either a hard copy or viewing them online. Um, give you a moment. While we're doing that, I want to thank our board member, Mary Acorn. I'm not even sure where Mary's sitting right now. But Mary has agreed to take the uh, minutes for us tonight, and um, we really appreciate it a lot. So we need a, uh, someone to move the um, approval of the minutes from last year's AGM. Thank you, Jan Medicek. Uh, oh, Jan was stretching. We need him at an auction. <laughs> Jan, you just moved it. OK. Uh, seconder, Joyce Doerr. Okay. Uh, any errors or omissions? All in favor? Country minded? Motion carried. Um, so Ben, are you able to see what's happening online there with the people that are joining us virtually? Okay. So we're good? Okay. 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 Thank you for that. So the work that you'll hear about tonight has been under the management and governance of a really strong uh, board of directors, and I want to introduce them. I'm going to start with uh, Mary Acorn. Mary has been a member of the uh, Fundraising and Development Committee and will chair an ad hoc committee this year that will take a look at membership. Hi to Mary. Patricia Caparoso, who's not with us in the room tonight, but I'm sure is with us uh, virtually, has been chairing the Land Management Committee over the past year. And uh, she's a real leader and motivator, and it's been wonderful. I've sat on that committee with her, and she's been uh, really motivational in pulling the work of, that, uh, of the land management piece together. Joyce Doerr, where's Joyce? Joyce is active in fundraising and development, and she also helps with facilities and special events and she's a woman about town she does all kinds of work for the trust and a real joy to uh, to work with Jurgen Kraus Jurgen is a valued contributor and advisor around planning due to work life commitments he won't be able to continue on in his position at the board table but he will be continuing as an important supporter Stefan LeBlanc Stefan is a communications manager uh, sorry advisor he has designed the protocol for our first environmentalist award. It was available this spring in five uh, island high schools. Michael Walsh, he's completing his term this year and can't be with us tonight, but he's a passionate environmentalist and supporter of the work of the trust. For the people that aren't returning, we do have uh, small tokens of appreciation for them and they will be uh, distributed to them in the near future, in the next few days. Also on the board, we have appointed directors from four founding organizations. Nature PEI is represented by Gerald McDougall. Uh, I thought Gerald was going to be here, but I haven't seen him. Uh, Gerald, as most of you would know, is a well-known um, natural uh, scientist and especially noted for his work with bald eagles. Gerald has sat on the land management committee and has helped with different jobs through the board and his knowledge and passion is always appreciated. Through the PEI Wildlife Federation, we have representative Kyla Miller, who's joining us virtually. And Kyla's always so enthusiastic around her approach to the work of the trust. We have UPEI Department of Biology represented through Dr. Kevin Tether. Uh, Kevin brings, of course, the support of the department and his expertise has been valued around the table. PEI Museum and Heritage is represented by outgoing director and secretary Linda Burko. 
Linda, Linda has been a member of the executive and she chairs the facilities committee. She's a knowledgeable, passionate leader in our midst and she will be greatly missed. Rounding out the team is the remainder of our executive. We've got treasurer Rob McKay. Rob makes himself available despite a demanding work schedule and he keeps us well advised around the finances. Bruce Craig, member, uh, is a member at large on the exec and he uh, comes to the board with an incredible background from um, parks and recreation, uh, land management and uh, also history and culture. So he adds a really amazing dimension to our work. And last but not least is our Vice President, Jan Matichek. Jan is a tireless visionary, keen intellect, and ability to connect with large issues, has assured that the work of the trust keeps moving forward at a sometimes staggering pace. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 2019-2020 Board of Directors. So now Megan and I are going to uh, highlight some of the work that has been accomplished over this past year. Oh, I'm switch. Okay. <laughs> there's a little bit of, uh, um, there's going to be a little bit of trying to keep the distance here while both presenting on the same presentation, <laughs> but we'll do our very best. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, this evening's meeting with the um, BC version of our uh, our fiscal year 2019 to 20, um, that's before COVID, when life was very, very different than it is now. Um, and uh, it's a bit of a stretch to remember what that looked like. Um, so I don't know why it's not advancing on here, but, hmm. okay. So I'm going to have to use my notes because it's not advancing on my screen. It's only advancing on <laughs> our first little technical glitch. It happens whenever I come anywhere near a computer. That's what I've been doing. Yeah. How about if you just select? But then I, I'm not seeing the yeah. buckets. It's hard to read that. Do you want to carry on with the notes there? And yeah. I'll see if oh, I can get this. Just if you can go back and we'll start with, yeah. No. No, it's really. Maybe start from beginning again. What were you using for? Just slideshow from beginning. Okay. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Okay. I think we're good to go. So we usually start the same way by looking at our our uh, our vision and our mission statements from our 2017 to 2022 strategic plan. And that vision is, we envision a future where PEI has a network of protected, robust natural areas championed by knowledgeable, engaged islanders. And some of that engagement you can see um, with newcomers from a Passport to Nature um, event that we held during this 2019 to 2020 fiscal year, um, learning more about the threatened species bobolink. So our mission is to serve the island community in natural areas expansion and conservation. And June, I need my notes back. 
Thank you. You're <laughs> um, so we'll start by using our strategies as placeholders. Strategy one in our strategic plan is to conserve natural areas in PEI. And we, we also support and facilitate the protection of other private lands by assisting landowners in navigating the designation process using the PEI Natural Areas Protection Act, something that we benefit greatly from in PEI that other provinces don't have um, the benefit of, of using as a tool. So our 2019-2020 year was our 40th anniversary year and the board and staff set a extremely ambitious goal of 1,000 new acres acquired. And you can see on the screen that it was 952 acres, which is like just so close. Um, but we also assisted a private landowner who's also in the room tonight um, in protecting two of her own parcels under the Natural Areas Protection Act. And those acres added up to 89. So we feel that we can rationalize getting to the 1,000 acre target, even if it wasn't all uh, our own acquisitions. Um, so the other, one of the couple of other key pieces there is that four of those were eco gifts. Uh, is, it's a federal program that allows um, individuals to uh, be exempt from capital gains tax and uh, PEI was second only to Ontario in the number of ecological gifts protected across Canada in the calendar year 2019. Um, our our eco-gift coordinator in Sackville um, suggested that if we were to do that on a per capita basis, Islanders blew all the other provinces out of the water in uh, donations of ecologically significant land. So it, he did the math and that would have been equivalent to 923 gifts in Ontario. And in actual, the actual numbers, their number was 26. So ours was 11, that was pretty darn good. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out with our land acquisitions was that three of those were expansions to our existing natural areas. And that connectivity piece is a really important one for us to try to um, increase the size of the blocks that we have protected so that they are less um, vulnerable to external threats. Um, I know the, the map's hard to see, but uh, we have donations in green relative to the white that are our existing natural areas. Um, Eco-gifts eco are in pink. They're also a form of donation. Split receipts are in yellow. That's where there's a donation component and a purchase component. Uh, so the donation piece they get a charitable tax receipt for. And then there's the straight out purchases in orange. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. And now I'm going to hold, uh, put it back over to June. So our, our stewardship piece um, is, a, is a key. Um, it isn't always a component for all trusts, but it's huge for us. And one of the key elements of our stewardship program is to have conservation guardians responsible for the properties that are under our purview. Um, we happen to have one conservation guardian that I know of in the room tonight, and maybe there are others. Just to show, uh, Anthony, I know you're there. Anthony Vrenz is, oh, and we have, we have quite a few conservation guardians here. Okay, that's great to know. So they're key uh, components of the stewardship program. Uh, as it says on the screen, there are 33 uh, dedicated uh, volunteers on 23 of our areas. Um, and we are hoping to expand that program. 
uh, over the next year. Patricia Caparoso, the land management coordinator, and I are very, uh, with Megan, are very eager to look at models that will help us to provide professional development for our conservation guardians and bring in uh, more people for a variety of purposes and try to really expand on that program. Megan mentioned the need for connectivity in our pieces of land, but there's also a need for connectivity with the land and the people that live in close proximity to the land. And we think that our conservation uh, uh, guardians can be a key to help us move that forward. Uh, passport to Nature events were huge this past year. It was the first time 174 people took um, part in them. They had educational engagement components and they were very, very well received. Another piece of stewardship is the involvement of corporate stewards. And right now we have four um, businesses that are helping out, Sekasui Diagnostics, Sable Arc Studios, Philip Agricultural, services who have been a long, long time supporter. I'm sure some people in the room could probably tell us how long that's gone on for, but they have contributed in so many ways. Um, they they uh, give a portion of the bird seed that is sold every year from their property, but they support us in other ways. And they're very, it's a very valued uh, relationship with all of these, but it's a long standing one of Phillips Agricultural Feed Services and Maritime Electric as well, valuable corporate sponsors. We're hoping to expand on that. And um, this year we've already added a couple of more people in with donations of variety of ways. One is uh, Century 21, Lee Jenkins supported our um, our environmentalist award, and Heather Millar uh, provided the artwork for the, the original artwork for the t-shirts that are over on, on this side, well, the three different images, all original art by Heather Millar, who's a fairly uh, well-known island artist. So we really, we really appreciate um, all of that. There were a couple of key initiatives that we wanted to um, focus on tonight as well, because they're new and they are um, they're initiatives that we hope to continue for a very long time. Uh, I, INT uh, started working with members of the Abiguit Conservation Society last year to monitor forest birds and manage invasive species in three culturally significant areas, uh, near Scotchfort in the Darash Pond area, uh, and on the Morel and Magell river systems. And we, we hope to be able to tell you at this time next year of some other really important collaborative projects that we have started with the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of PEI as well. And we, we see these as important, not only from a conservation perspective, but also from a reconciliation perspective. And another really big piece for us this past year involved engagement of the significant community of veterans in PEI, a very large group, um, those who live outside of the Maritimes probably don't uh, recognize what an important community they are in the Maritimes relative to um, potentially some other areas in, in, um, in Canada. And they can benefit tremendously from being in a quiet and safe natural setting. So we, we installed a serenity circle in the middle of our largest natural area um, that's the Jenkins complex. It's well over 600 acres and hosted veterans on a beautiful fall day. That's this picture right here. Uh, the, the PEI Military Family Resource Center has a key to that complex now, and they are free to bring in veterans with mobility issues to use that as a healing space um, whenever it's needed. And there are other individuals within the veterans community who also have easy access to that serenity circle 
um, for those who find it a space where they can heal. It's an, it's an incredibly beautiful location and very quiet. One of the things that we were hoping um, or had designed with that was uh, when you're in the middle of 600 acres, um, you really don't hear anything. It's very hard to get away from road traffic anywhere in PEI, and that is one place where you can do that. And as always, uh, one of our, our components of, of strategy two, investing in conservation, is, is working with species at risk. And in that respect, too, we expanded those programs last year as we worked with our federal and provincial partners to protect the endangered piping plover. That's, that's a very long standing program, threatened barn and bank swallow, and also bobolink across PEI. Um, we also initiated a program that is um, a four year program that is working in, uh, in uh, coastal ecosystems, and it's um, a new species at risk initiative that is driven by the federal government who are looking at species at risk conservation in a new way by focusing more on the habitat than on individual species at risk. So we've identified the coastal ecosystem of PEI as a priority place and we are working with a number of partners. Uh, I think the um, at least 12 and probably more who are working um, in, in, uh, in a different capacity on that coastal ecosystem project. And that, that includes uh, Dr. Tether at the back, who is collaborating with us on supporting a master's student looking at the impacts of aquaculture and particularly oyster, um, surface oyster aquaculture on shorebirds and waterfowl. And, and that individual, Jenna, won't show up in, in, an, in a previous slide, but we really do feel like uh, she's one of the team. And we would be remiss not to mention our uh, strong team of staff that we have supporting the legs on the ground on all of our properties and certainly working really hard at their desks at, at Ravenwood. Um, it's, a, it's a growing organization and that growth requires uh, extremely de dedicated staff that are willing to put in the hours to get the work done. and and to work with a very energetic board as well, of course, which can be challenging, I know, at times. Um, so at the beginning of the year, though, this year, we did say goodbye to two of our longtime employees, Barb McDonald and Julie Lynn Zahavich. And Barb was with uh, this organization since its beginning. So a real, a real loss in many ways to not have uh, Barb in our midst over these past months. Uh, both employees left uh, to pursue work in, uh, with the province, actually. And we're, um, it's challenging to uh, fill the shoes and the holes that they've left behind. Uh, late in the fiscal year, we welcomed our finance officer, Janelle McDonald. Janelle's at the uh, registration table. And Ben Russell joined the team, and his skills are really allowing us to have this uh, online version happening as, as we speak tonight. Farmland Birds Coordinator, Leanne Toll, who's here with us tonight as well, handled our Farm Birds program and delivery for the fourth year, including an important productivity research component and the Alice delayed hay compliance monitoring. During the summer, Tori Hartley Cox and Vicki Johnson were our piping plover field staff, and Brett McKinnon and Brendan Kelly were the forest bird, tech bird technicians. Ian Crowell was one of the land stewardship technicians, and he helped out with all the programs at one time or another throughout the summer. Ian uh, <laughs> I use iNaturalist on my, an app on my phone when I'm trying to identify uh, something um, when I'm walking or, or whatever I'm doing in the, in the woods or on the beach. And uh, I noticed Ian comes up as one of the identifying people uh, for that particular app, which is kind of neat for me to see name of someone that I know. Uh, so a hard, uh, hard, hard 
felt thank you to all of our staff uh, for all the work they do, and uh, and we hope that they will continue on in that in that regard. Uh, so. We're looking to strengthen our governance model. Uh, this past year, we developed a, a matrix to allow us to recruit uh, board members that fill particular skill sets that we have been lacking. Um, if you look at um, the bios of the board members that I introduced, you'll certainly see that uh, we have great diversity and a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, already on the board, and, um, and the incoming will be uh, of the same ilk. This will also require, though, um, us to strengthen our fundraising strategies, and uh, we, we will have to have strong initiatives in that regard. And in 2019, we took a hard look at our compliance with the Canadian Land Trust standards and practice. That was a really interesting exercise for me. The Land Management Committee uh, took that on very responsibly. And this is an organization, the Canadian Land Trust Alliance, uh, Island Nature Trust fits under it, and they provide standards and practices for us to comply with. Um, really, really important work for us, really important guidelines, uh, and we're hoping that we'll stay within, their, uh, within that mandate. So that's a snippet of, um, of what has been going on uh, with, the, with the trust. Um, it's a, it seems like so much happens so quickly, and to try and condense it all into this sort of a, a quick uh, presentation is challenging for sure. But you can see that we've had a hardworking uh, board, and I'm going to ask Jan Matichek, the vice uh, president, to come to the podium now to introduce our um, representing the nominating committee to uh, put forward the recommendations from that particular group. Oh, are we doing the treasure? Sorry, Rob. I was trying to skip you. We have to do the treasurer's report. Sorry, Jen. Sorry, Jan. So, Rob, Rob McKay, our illustrious treasurer. All right, I'll get rid of that. Now, first of all, I'll start by saying, uh, well, good evening. Uh, I'll start by saying you don't have to pretend. I know this is not the most riveting part of our presentation, so uh, where we go here? I think F5 works. Uh, voila. Okay, so uh, uh, once again, um, our annual uh, uh, audit for the year ended. Oh, I'm going to take this off. Our annual audit for the year ended... March 31st, 2020, was performed by Fitzpatrick and Company. Uh, we've prepared a limited number of, of copies of the complete financial statements, which were available here on your way in. Uh, and also, for those who wish, who did not receive them tonight, or if you're watching from online, uh, feel free to drop by the On a Nature Trust anytime. We'd be happy to, to uh, allow you to come in and view them anytime. Now for the, perhaps the most relevant part of the financial statements is the is the opinion or the auditor's report and uh, just just for kicks I'll give you a quick primer on financial statements financial statements when prepared by an, an accountant uh, they come in three forms uh, first of all a compilation secondly a, a review engagement or third is a is an audit um, and a compilation and I'm gonna I'm gonna simply paraphrase these but a, an audit basically says the statements add up and make sense, and they might be right. A review engagement basically says, we did some analysis, asked a bunch of questions, um, and didn't come, up, didn't come across anything to lead us to believe that they're wrong. And an audit is, we, bid, we did a bunch of analysis, we asked a bunch of questions, and we saw enough evidence to be able to say that they're probably right. So it's never perfect, and we have ha we've adopted the, uh, the audit route, and our, our financial statements have been audited. Um, the audit's uh, opinion, um, I've, been, I've been an accountant now for 11 years, and uh, when I first started, it filled the audit report, or a typical audit report would fill the majority of a page. 
Uh, now with COVID, we've overlapped into the third page now. Um, so you can feel free to read that if you wish. It's at the front. Um, but I'll highlight these two paragraphs, which basically say, and I'm not going to read them, but they basically say that except for the disclaimer about the inherent limitations in auditing donations and fundraising, which we're dealing with cash, uh, we have received a clean audit report. So we did receive a clean bill of health once again this year from our auditor. So just, and, and we're taking a very high level approach, okay? And I will state that if anybody does want to delve a little deeper into this, feel free to ask any questions um, either tonight or, or at other times. We're more than happy to, to elaborate. Um, but just as you can see from the pie chart, <clears throat> Our revenues this year uh, totaled $600,000, uh, and this was an increase over last year, um, uh, largely because the trust established new contribution agreements with Environment and Climate Change Canada to protect uh, coastal ecosystems in PEI and coastal and riparian wetland habitat in the Maritimes. Um, now, what's not shown in those, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the revenues for those that can't see, they are fairly small there. Grants and sponsorships were a little over $86,000. Fundraising and the dinner are a little over $50,000. Donations were almost $35,000. And the contracts were $404,000, with uh, the remainder being from investments and miscellaneous items, including memberships. Now, in addition to these revenues, so these $600,000 in revenues, we also received, and this is notable, uh, we also received $580,000 worth of in-kind land donations, uh, $423,000 in grants and contributions for land acquisition, $52,000 for donations for land acquisition, <clears throat> and $31,000, or sorry, $36,000 in donations that were dedicated to the stewardship and endowment funds. So. I'm not wearing a hat tonight, but for those that made those donations, they are considerable. If you're within hearing distance, either here in the room or, or over YouTube, I would take off my Australian hat to you. I, we, we certainly appreciate uh, from the bottom of our hearts your, your kind donations and contributions to the Ida Nature Trust. Um, so moving on to the expense side. And again, I'm taking a high level approach. You can review the, the expenses as they're shown there, but I'll highlight three items from this. Uh, administration costs you'll see are up considerably from last year, uh, but I will note that about $16,000 of the administration costs this year related to the new uh, contribution agreements, so i.e. the Coastal Protection Program. So that's, that was a considerable increase, so it's not surprising that that is up over last year. Also, a new line item this year, the disbursement of grants, and I'd like to, to clarify that. Um, that's a new account item that relates directly to one of our contribution agreements where Out of Nature Trust receives funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada and disperses it to other nonprofit organizations. Um, this expense amount of 65190 was fully offset by a contribution agreement for the same amount. So, so that was a cash neutral uh, item for the Ida Nature Trust. I'll also highlight that professional fees are up, not surprisingly with the increase in, in land acquisitions this year and overall activity, that of course is up. Um, and I will point out perhaps the professional fees, we really need to combine that with appraisal fees. I noticed that that was down despite our, our additional land acquisitions this year. So I think it would be better to look at those two numbers together. So we're still, it's still an increase, but uh, just to highlight that. Um, and lastly, and I'll point this out, the wages, as you can see, are remarkably close year over year. Um, I will state briefly that the wages were up a little bit, um, but were, were it not for the departure of, uh, of, of Barb and, and Julie Lynn, um, they, would have been, uh, they would have been a little higher than that this year. Uh, they left and it was a period of time before we were able to at least replace Barb. Um, and I will say, um, you know, as the treasurer, of course, I have a lot to do with the person that's in that financial role. Um, and certainly I had a lot of interaction with Barb. And as, as Megan had stated, or, or June, I'm not sure who had pointed it out, she has been here since I think they uh, set the moonwalk to music. So it's been a long time. And uh, over my five and a half years, I've worked closely with her. 
and uh, I certainly acknowledge and appreciate her assistance, but I will state as well that her replacement, uh, Janelle McDonald, is a, a fellow CPA, so I know we're in good hands, and I've, I've certainly appreciated working with Janelle over the past recent months, so uh, we're in good financial, uh, in good control that way. Um, lastly, let me just bring this slide up. <clears throat> so this is a really high-level view, and this statement that you're looking at adheres to absolutely no financial statement uh, uh, policies, but um, it does make sense. So if you take all of our revenues and all of our expenditures, we were left with almost $100,000. Now that $100,000, we added to that the in-kind donations of $580,000, which are not included on the, state, on the face of the financial statements, grants and donations which were restricted for land purchases of four seventy-five. dollars and then we took out of that the land acquisitions this year, which were just a little over $1.1 million. And we also purchased um, almost $15,000 of capital assets, the, the uh, paving uh, being the most notable there of, I think, a little over $12,000. So with that, uh, we were left with almost a break-even amount of about $5,800. Now, what we're all about is land. And so we started the year with a little over $4.6 million in land. And I'll remind you, uh, for those who may have forgotten from last year, um, this value is the, it represents the fair market value of the land at the time it was acquired. So our land, if we were to value the land at current fair market values, it would be significantly higher than this. But this represents the amounts as it was acquired. The purchased land, so we added, of course, the donated land of, 580 plus the purchased land that we purchased of 554,000 to end with 5.7, a little over almost 5.8 million dollars in uh, in land now. And that, my friends, is all I have to present to you tonight. So, are there any questions? If there's any tough ones, I'll just look pleadingly to Megan or, Jan or Janelle. Okay, um, hearing none, I'll conduct the. Uh, a couple of matters of, of business. Uh, first of all, I, of course, move that the treasurer's report be accepted as presented. Is there a seconder? Okay. Okay. Um, Dan? I'm not sure who's recording these. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> all right. And also, um, it has proposed, been proposed that uh, Fitzpatrick and Company once again be appointed as auditors for the coming year. Accordingly, I move that, or that Fitzpatrick and Company be appointed as the auditor for the Ida Nature Trust for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2021. Is there a seconder? Leo Chivery, thank you. And with that, I will terminate the uh, riveting part of tonight's meeting and we have to vote oh on the motion. oh how do you do you want to call them? okay so <laughs> so uh, for the treasurer's report all in favor signify by raising your hand country minded motion carried and uh, the appointment of our auditors um, all in favor country minded motion carried thank you rob thank you. So we'll call on Jan now for our uh, nominating committee report. Uh, ben, ben is going to let us know about that. So he didn't give any indication, Dan. Yeah. Did, were there any questions, Ben, from the YouTube? Yes. Okay. Do you know those from New York and Oh. Ah. Fantastic. Thanks, so, Dan. Okay. See, there's like something, I'm sending out some kind of a charge. <laughs> ben? Yeah. It's like, 
that's saying just don't do. So I'm don't trying to click on that, okay. and it won't let me. Have you broken the internet? <laughs> See? That's nice, isn't it? So it's on that one. Right. I won't. <laughs> Okay, so, so the next. There we go. There's a selection of used masks here. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, and uh, and. Uh, taking part in our meeting. It's very, very important that we have uh, we have regular contact uh, with our membership and uh, that you, you know what we're, what we're planning to do and what we have done in the past year. Um, as a relatively new board member, I, uh, I, uh, I really, you know, I'm excited to be part of this organization. Uh, I am not an islander, you can probably tell. Um, but, uh, you know, I am, I, I, I say, islander by choice which is a new category of person that seems to be more prevalent here than in the past. Um, but I, I'm really, really happy with this board. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this organization and this board, which is working incredibly hard. And it has a real mix of, uh, of, of you know, local talent of all, of all types, both uh, you know, substantive skill, hard skills, soft skills, contacts, energy ideas. And, uh, and uh, we continue to expand our expertise along the strategic plan we have developed uh, and uh, and mix and match our skills uh, and add people that we think can really help us to move forward and as I like to say to do more faster and more strategically um, and I think that's kind of what this is all about so I'm here to propose uh, on behalf of the nominating committee four new board members um, all of them have had long and distinguished careers and I could talking about an hour about each one of them, but this is only a short summary. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will call for uh, a motion to, uh, to, to adopt these, uh, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to, to nominate them as, uh, as new members of the board, and also ask for nominations from the floor for any other uh, board members uh, that may be uh, you know, proposed by the membership. So I'll start with uh, Mary Ann Bowden, who is in the room here as well, Mary Ann. Okay. Now, um, Mary Ann Bowden is, uh, has had a lifelong passion for nature, and she's one of the few people that managed to combine that passion for nature with the love of the law and with the academic world. And uh, she had a long and distinguished career uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, teaching environmental law, property law, including land use and planning law, uh, and water law. She also uh, acted as the as the assistant dean uh, since, and, and uh, she only retired in 2012, uh, and uh, she has uh, returned to PI, um, where uh, she is uh, she has been uh, on the board of the Upton Farmland uh, Trust, and uh, has been active in uh, some of the research around the Water Act uh, and the uh, securing of the Water Act to be adopted by the PI government. Now, Mary Ann brings with her a wealth of experience with uh, environmental laws uh, and policies, as well as the understanding of the various issues involved in environmental, uh, environmental planning and legislation. And she also took part in uh, drafting laws, adopting them at the provincial level, national level, as well as internationally, where even worked with CEDA as well. Um, she splits her time between Mount Carmel and Charlottetown, bringing a connection to Summerside, which is also important because we have so many of our members in Charlottetown. And I think Summerside is an important area for us. We have you know, a number of, uh, of uh, properties there as well. And we think that her knowledge of environmental laws, legislation and policies will really add a lot to our, to our work. The second uh, uh, board member I would like to propose is Tyler Cody, who is here as well. Now, as... Uh, Tyler Cody, there he is. You can see him without the mask. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, Tyler Cody is um, an Islander and a retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, he is, uh, happens to be the nephew of one of the founders of Other Nature Trust, uh, Professor Daryl Guignon, who uh, instilled in him from his, from his uh, childhood a love of nature and a love of Other Nature Trust. Now, Tyler obtained his, uh, his Bachelor of Art in Psychology from UPI and went on to obtain his Master's in Military Psychology at the Adler University in Chicago. And he's a strong background in PTSD treatment, peer support, and healing through connection with nature. He has over 10 years of experience of various boards across Canada and acting various capacities of committees of nonprofit organizations uh, you know, throughout, uh, throughout our country. He'll bring a much needed younger voice to our board and add elements of, of psychology and environmental science to our environmental work. So we're very happy to, to, to welcome him to our, to our board. Then we have Roger Coffin, who is right here. Now, Roger is a native islander. Uh, his grandfather was the mayor of Montague, in fact, little known fact. Um, now, Roger had a very rich and diverse career in the private sector for over 20 years, working across Canada, and then on, went on to join the government. When the Atlantic Canada Opportunity, Opportunities Agency was being formed, he was asked to use his private sector experience to take charge of the business support role, which he did. And then he used this experience and his charm to attract aerospace businesses to set up their operations in Canada. And uh, he was very successful in that, having uh, brought companies with uh, sales of over 300 million and 400 employees to, to the island. Now, Roger loves nature, the outdoors, especially salmon fishing, hunting, and working with his two pointers. He played an important role in the Marguerite and Miramichi Salmon Associations and the Atlantic Salmon Federation, where he was on the board. He's also a charter member of the Montague Rotary Club and served with distinction on the Island Development, Co Development Committee for the last year assisting with our fundraising for Crown Point, which is very successful, a very successful transaction for us. Uh, and he also played an important role in bringing in a donation of 400 acres just recently, which will help to meet our, our target of 1,000 acres a year. Uh, uh, we are very pleased to have Roger on the board. He is a wise and very well co connected uh, individual. He, and um, his advice will be key to our ability to do more, more quickly, and raise the funding we need uh, to, to both acquire land more strategically and also to steward the land the way it deserves to be stewarded. Then we have Gordon McKay. Gordon is an islander who is not only a successful lawyer, but also has a background in biology, as well as a tremendous amount of experience in governance of nonprofit organizations and in operating philanthropic programs. Gordon is a partner with the firm of Carr, Stevenson and McKay, specializing in corporate law. He received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Dalhousie and then went on to obtain his uh, law degree from uh, UNB, as well as an MBA from University of Pennsylvania Island. Now, Gordon has a tremendous resume. I have, it's a very, very impressive, a long resume. I'll just hit some highlights. He has a tremendous amount of experience serving a of, of number of boards and committees, a number in the law society, uh, in the legal field, including the PI Law Society, as well as the Federation of Law Societies of Canada and the Canadian Bar Association. His long list of activities includes also serving as a chair of the Red Cross Montesport Relay, chair of the PI United Way campaign, chair of the QBH Foundation, and serving as governor of the Board of Governors of UPI and a chair of the Inspire campaign of the University of Pennsylvania Island. Now, Gordon brings to our board a wealth of experience with governance of nonprofit organizations, with development and implementation of philanthropic programs and many contacts with our educational institutions and businesses. We're really excited to have so many talented individuals uh, agreeing to work on our board. And I'm pleased to move that the four nominees be elected 
to the board of directors of Island Nature Trust. Can I have a second D? Diane Griffin. So, thank you. All those in favor, please signal your agreement by saying A. I. Are there any opposed? No, Ben, do you have anything from the internet world? No. Okay. Okay. Then uh, to close up the process, uh, I would like to ask if there are any other nominations to the board from the floor or from our online viewers. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Going once, going once, going twice. So, okay. So in that case, I'll move that the nomination process be closed. And I would like to uh, have a seconder for that. Rob, Rob McKay, thank you. Uh, so I, uh, so hereby the nomination process to the board is closed and the four nominated uh, board members are hereby um, nominated to the board. Thank you. So I, um, I have the, the honor of, of um, reading the citation for the Honorable J. Angus McLean Natural Areas Award for 2020. And uh, Rob will be up um, shortly <laughs> um, to, to help with the presentation. The Honorable J. Angus McLean was a champion for land in Prince Edward Island. He left a great legacy of caring for land that manifested throughout his work as a thoughtful politician, premier, naturalist, forester, sheep raiser, and blueberry grower. His governance actions continue to influence the island today. The Honorable J. Angus McLean Natural Areas Award was established by Island Nature Trust and is presented annually to honor a group, agency, or individual that has made a significant contribution to the protection of natural areas in Prince Edward Island. The winner is selected by an awards committee made up of members of INT's board of directors from nominations that are received from the public. This year, the awards committee, after reviewing a number of superb nominations, has selected Ms. Jean Mackey as the distinguished recipient of the Honorable J. Angus McLean Natural Areas Award. The nomination was submitted by Jill Spilisi with support from Rosemary Curley and Nature PEI. Jeannie Mackey has spent her adult life working to safeguard one of PEI's most important and threatened ecosystems, our forests. PEI's hardwood forests in particular are underrepresented in our protected areas network, yet provide tremendous natural services to today's and tomorrow's generations of islanders. Recently, Jeannie designated close to 100 acres of upland hardwood forest in the Panette Belfast area as two protected natural areas, with covenants under the PEI Natural Areas Protection Act. Thank you, Jeannie, for increasing our acreage to 1,000 acres. <laughs> for decades, she has been the caretaker of trees in those woods, planting red oak and other native species to enhance diversity and provide a home for the area's bird populations and other wildlife species. Jeannie's history with trees began when she was a child, growing up on the south shore of Lake Superior, playing in the woods surrounding her home and visiting her grandfather's logging camp. Her love of forests and trees led her to spend years studying native trees, plants, and soil so that she could steward forests responsibly. Jeannie moved to PEI while in her 20s. Here she has raised concerns often about PEI's shrinking forests 
and the implication to young families whose children should know the joy of walking through a hardwood forest. Most recently, Jeannie has applied her great observation skills and love for walking the trails along the south side of Wrights Creek into a campaign to restore and extend that remnant riparian forest. By bringing together individuals from the watershed community, residents, McPhail Woods, Island Nature Trust, and politicians, Jeannie initiated and guided tree planting in an effort to extend the buffer zone to 100 meters. Now, 27 acres of woods and trails along the south side of Wrights Creek will soon be designated as a protected natural area under the Natural Areas Protection Act. Jeannie deservedly joins some of PEI's best known protectors of land, contributing to the enduring securement of our island as one of Canada's most beautiful assets. I end with Jeannie's words. If preservation and protection of PEI's natural resources goes wrong, nothing else will go right. Ask yourself, what kind of PEI do you want your children to grow up in? Jeannie, I invite you to please come forward to accept your award. Well, this was a great shock when I was told last week and uh, wasn't expecting it at all, of course, but I appreciate the being thought in this way and especially for the connected with the McLean family who have been dear friends since, well, for about 45 years. So that's, it's very special. I, I know what great care Angus took care of his woods and Rob is continuing. And I just have to make small correction about Wright's Creek. It was a group of us working together and um, we asked for 60 meters we asked for 100 meters, we were given 60 meters, and then um, Minister Jameson decided it would be a natural area and 100 meters. So it came in a little roundabout way, but we'll be looking for a lot of help to, to turn some of that field into a, an Acadian forest. So thank you very much, everybody. See if it works this time. Showing on the screen. There we go. Um, so, so this is the the last presentation of the evening, and um, and I will start it, and and June will do the majority of of it. But it's really about um, looking forward now after 40 years and, and looking to another 40 and, and what that path for growth might look like. So, oh, again, okay. <laughs> it's not showing on the screen. Um, where we go is based on an, an extremely strong foundation that has been built by 
many of you in this room over the last 40 years. And, and what we have at this point in time is, is a testament to that. So we are at or a little over 5,000 acres of protected uh, natural area in PEI owned and stewarded by Island Nature Trust. Um, in many cases, we have two or three levels of legal protection on that land through ownership, through protection under a provincial legislative framework, the Natural Areas Protection Act, and in some cases, a third level of protection, a federal level through the Ecological Gifts Program. Um, it's hard to imagine any land that could be more secure in its conservation and uh, um, protection than that. We also have a diversity of skills and talent represented in our staff and in our board and in our volunteers and our larger membership, all of whom are so eager and pulling towards the same goals. And we are, we, we are finding um, ways to uh, grow our engagement and our connections with the larger community in PEI as we bring in other skill sets um, to what has for a very long time being a bunch of biologists <laughs> working really hard uh, that were extremely dedicated um, to, uh, to broaden our skill base and, and, uh, and the talents there. As Jan mentioned, um, we also see a growing need for speed in PEI uh, for a very uh, large number of reasons. Uh, we've singled out a couple here. Um, there is an accelerating pace of change occurring in PEI that we see in, on a couple of main fronts, both in terms of the development um, that we're seeing in PEI, but also in terms of uh, the climate stresses that we are um, uh, witnessing every year now. Uh, I just pointed, I just grabbed a couple of the main ones in terms of our rate of development. Uh, coastal cottages seem to be popping up everywhere and, uh, and we're also seeing many of them now as Airbnbs, which uh, changes the flavor of the, uh, the coastal environment. Um, we also are seeing forest conversion to agriculture as the price of agricultural land starts to climb um, very quickly. I think that uh, 2019, it was a 22% increase in the price of agricultural land in PEI. Uh, so when that agricultural land is that expensive, it is much cheaper to cut forests down and convert them to agriculture. We are also seeing an accelerated impact of climate change. We have um, all witnessed the, the changes that occur when you get these extreme storm events, the extreme drought events, um, and the stresses that puts on our natural ecosystems. And when they are not as resilient as they once were, that does exacerbate those challenges as well. And we also have been talking a lot this past year about our need to address our internationally um, recognized targets that we have committed to um, in, in terms of our biodiversity targets. Uh, the province has a, has a target, a reduced target of 7% protected land mass in PEI. And, and they're wrapped up in those international targets are other targets related more to sustainability and how we live on the land. And in that respect, that ties in nicely to our need for carbon sinks and our need for ecosystem services and our, our need to, to retain those services 
on our little island. So in an effort to, um, to address all of these uh, pieces that Megan uh, is talking about, we held a strategic planning session in the summer. Uh, we went to the beautiful church at Indian River. Uh, the session was conducted. It was an online live uh, dialogue, uh, pretty 2020-ish, uh, and conducted by Hilberg Associates, designed and conducted for us. So it was a pretty amazing experience we had. And the guidance to come up with the questions for our strategic planning were influenced by uh, the membership survey that was done earlier in the year. And I want to thank all the individuals that participated in that. We had a terrific response rate and your responses informed uh, the strategic planning session. So you will see the results of what your input told us uh, as, as we go through this next year. Uh, really important uh, feedback we received. Um, so, through the strategic planning session, we identified, and this is draft, we identified four pillars of excellence. The first one is around um, sustainability, um, certainly looking at stewardship under, as I mentioned, the land, uh, Canadian Land Trust uh, standards and practices, but also um, for our mission sustain sustainability, we also have to be financially sustainable. And you can see by the uh, financial statements that it takes a lot of uh, hard-earned dollars to uh, to keep this op operation moving at its current pace, and then to increase, it will require even more uh, support from a variety of, uh, of methods. Um, we also identified eco ecosystem stewardship knowing that we have to be proactive now, and we should have been more proactive even 40 years ago when this organization started to be sure that we have lands protected for generations to come. I've mentioned connectivity twice, and here it is a third time. Uh, we want to make sustainable relationships with our stakeholders and get uh, uh, better partnerships going with a, a variety of our stakeholders to ensure that we work in a collaborative manner. We also want to have in place good management systems for people, for our staff and for our volunteers. Uh, and we want to be viewed as one of the best places to work, either as a volunteer or as a staff member. So those are our four uh, pillars that were identified uh, through our strategic planning session. That's draft, and now the uh, strategic planning committee will have to continue the work on that, and hopefully it will be done uh, in the near future. Okay, so in order to continue with this kind of growth, um, we also had a look at our, our um, staffing arrangement. And our current executive director, our one and only Megan Harris, who you can see uh, through the presentations tonight, has uh, guided the work, is highly knowledgeable and passionate about the work that has continued to happen through the trust. She made a command decision to take her direction over to her passion and move over into the position that you'll see on the screen as director of conservation. If indeed we're successful in allowing her to make that move, it means that we need to hire a new executive director and we will stick with that title for continuity. You can see by the chart the way we envision uh, the staff positioning to look uh, in a few years time. We will be, uh, we have a search committee in place. The executive is the search committee now, and we've added um, a person with HR experience to our uh, committee, Linda Goodett. Uh, so we are in that position. I would be remiss not to right now say a, a grateful thanks to Megan who puts in inordinate, an inordinate number of hours every single week and attends um, functions for us on the weekends and the evenings. And ha her passion and dedication has been so important to the, to the work of the trust over these past four years, is it? Five. Okay. Rob's got it. Okay. Yeah. They're really, really wonderful. Um, and I, I think we all know that. So thank you very much, Megan. So 
anybody have any questions regarding any of those, any of the future plans? Anything online there, Ben? So that's a look at the future. So we looked at what we did this year. That's a look to where we hope to be standing here this time next year with a, a little um, different uh, view for us. Um, our annual report will be available next week. Um, it will look something like this. If anybody wants a hard copy, uh, they can drop by Ravenwood and pick one up, but certainly it will be available online. Um, and I want to just close by saying a huge thank you to all the people who support the work of the Trust in so many different ways. Uh, the conservation guardians, the people that work in our office, uh, the people who donate land, the, the members. Uh, members are our, our foundation and we really appreciate every single one of you. Um, We'd be remiss not to mention that October 4th, there is a big celebration of land planned for Crown Point. Uh, there'll be a hike down to the uh, headland guided by Megan, and we'll have a group of kayaks going out to paddle over to the, the headland at the same time. So we're meeting that day on October 4th. You can find it on our website, um, October 4th at the Alexander Community Center. And we hope to have a great turnout for that event. You do have to register because of COVID restrictions. So if you're interested in coming, please um, please make, make it known and get your registration. And we do have a good number have already registered. Um, I think that is, uh, I think that's it. So uh, with that, I'll call for a motion. Oh, oh, don't forget the shirts, Joyce, I'm sorry. So Joyce has worked tirelessly to have these shirts with the Heller Miller, um, Heather Miller uh, original art on them. So anybody that's interested in the shirt, uh, talk, to, talk to Joyce, or I'm sure that the staff can help with that as well. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, motion for adjournment. So moved. That was Rosemary Curley. That's very appropriate. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, hope to see you all next year, and thank you again for your support and involvement. refreshments and hopefully uh, a bit of time for some uh, social time with with the people in the room but make sure you uh, take advantage of the great refreshments all COVID friendly
Thank you. 